Hi, I'm Dave Champlin, a biology professor at the University of Southern Maine, and in this video, I'm going to use blue clay as a model for DNA, and uh, the blue clay represents the familiar double-stranded DNA helix. The blue clay would be thousands of nucleotide letters long. I'm using clay and markers to build physical models on my story because it's a physical story. You should be confident you can understand this because you're looking and learning a physical story. The second reason I'm using clay and markers is because research on how students learn has shown that a powerful way for students to learn science concepts is for the students to make models. And so I'm encouraging you to get out markers and paint and clay and paper and build models as you learn these concepts. Each uh, species on Earth uses DNA as the primary heritable molecule. From our parents, we inherited all the DNA that we'll need. We got one genome from our mom, and we inherited one genome from our dad. A genome is the amount of DNA information needed for one species. So, one human genome from mom and one human genome from dad. That's all the information we'll ever need, and so you should think of DNA as a storage molecule, like the memory on your computer. You know that on your computer, you don't open all the memory at once. Instead, you open a portion of the memory, and similarly, not all of the DNA is used at once when it's time to output the information we inherited from our parents. Instead, just a portion of the DNA is used, like you're opening up one file on a computer. The output of DNA is a molecule called RNA. The RNA is copied from the DNA information. So I'm going to add a little yellow here to represent the DNA that gets copied during output into RNA. Since it's not copied all the time, there must be other regions of the DNA that regulate the expression or output of this information. Before we get to that, I want to introduce some concepts about this part. The first is that the output is done by an enzyme that's found in every cell. The enzyme is called RNA polymerase. The function of RNA polymerase is to bind to this region and copy it into RNA. That process is called transcription, and so this part of the DNA is referred to as the transcription unit. The RNA polymerase binds and then begins to transcribe the DNA into RNA as it slides down the transcription unit of DNA. As it does, the RNA gets longer until it reaches the end of the transcription unit, releases the RNA polymerase and full-length RNA. That's a process called transcription. The next thing is to talk about the regulation of transcription. And transcription regulation occurs based on these regions. There are two important regions of DNA. Right next to the transcription unit is a region called the promoter and further away is a region that's called the enhancer. These are going to regulate gene expression, but an important concept is this DNA doesn't change. Our cells have all the DNA we inherited from our parents, including the output transcription units, and also the regulatory regions, and they're not changing. Each of our cells has something called genomic equivalence. That means they have the entire genome, one from mom, one from dad, to make the whole organism. So this regulatory region isn't going to change, and we'll talk in a second about what does change. First, let me say that together, the regulatory region and the transcription unit form a gene. So that marks a gene. A gene is the output information, transcription unit, plus uh, the necessary regulatory region. In cells, there are just two 
kinds of genes. There are just two types of genes. One type of gene is called a coding gene. Coding genes code for proteins. So we have the hemoglobin gene that codes for hemoglobin proteins. Those are the genes that science students learn in class about first. The other class of genes are called non-coding genes. They don't code for proteins. The RNA output from coding genes is referred to as RNA polymerase. The RNA output from all the other types of, of non-coding genes has a variety of different names. We're gonna focus on this messenger RNA and mRNA is its abbreviation. This is going to code for a protein, and so part of the transcription unit is referred to as the coding region. The coding region has the information needed to uh, synthesize the protein. That work is going to be done using the RNA and an enzyme called the ribosome. Through a process of translation, the ribosome is going to use the RNA to synthesize proteins. In this case, the myogenin protein that is talked about in some of the other videos. So, using the myogenin gene, when the time is right during muscle differentiation, the RNA polymerase binds and transcribes the DNA into RNA that's then translated using the coding region of the RNA into myogenin proteins. Next, let's just move some of these terms out of the way so we can talk about that regulation. And that's our last piece. The, I mentioned the promoter enhancer of a gene don't change. They're the same in each cell. The dynamic part of this story and the output so, for example, when you click on the computer to open the file, what that is, is proteins that bind to the enhancer and the promoter. These proteins are in the cell, and they're referred to as transcription factors. And there's a set of proteins in the cell that can bind to the promoter, and they show RNA polymerase where to start. There's another set of proteins I'm going to use this example of MyOD that's used in other videos. The MyOD protein binds to the enhancer of the myogenin gene. Collectively, MyOD and these proteins are referred to as transcription factors. And transcription factors are a big part of the story. Because again, they're like the, your finger that pushes the button to open the computer file that you want to access. Transcription factors are the regulators that tell where, when, and how much of a gene to be expressed.